Bitcoin is Bitcoin is on track to exceed all-time highs, and we all know what happens after altcoin season. So on this channel, we try to bring you high-quality altcoins that we think are going to do well in the bull market, and one of those is Goldfinch. It fits within the private credit narrative, and even if you look at other projects like Ave Compound and Maker, who did over collateralized lending, which is way less favorable. These protocols reach four, five, six billion dollar market caps, and these private credit protocols are still under a hundred million dollars. So in this video, we're gonna be covering, like I said, Goldfinch. We're gonna go through the white paper, we're gonna go through the tokenomics, we're gonna go through the metrics, we're gonna see how they compare to their competitors. Uh, and then at the end of the video, we're gonna do a short platform walkthrough to see how intuitive the UI is. JT, what you got, man? Yeah, man. So you can never really go wrong if you're named after a golden bird, for one. For two, Goldfinch is solving a huge problem in that every lending protocol that you've pretty much seen in the space uh, requires an over-collateralization 99.9% .9 of the time. That basically eliminates 99% of your potential market right there. So by providing under-collateralized loans, it literally changes the game and decreases the barrier to entry for individuals that otherwise, or even entities that otherwise would not have been able to access funding, especially in underdeveloped countries. So excited about this one. Yeah, guys, and just to piggyback on the private credit, if you look at, like, he, like JT said, you can mainly get access to over collateralized lending in crypto. This is really impractical because the whole point and borrowing money is to get access to money you didn't have before. Guys, think about how impractical it would be if you went to go take out a mortgage and the house was 300K and you had to put down 350 to 400K. It's not how real people borrow money in the real world and it's for damn sure not how institutions borrow money in the real world. And if you look at these crypto companies, which a lot of these private credit protocols are aiming to service, along with small to medium-sized enterprises and, you know, foreign lending as well, these crypto companies can't get loans in traditional banks. So they have to go to these protocols. Not only that, interest rates are high and the credit markets is almost like a monopoly. So the few players are setting the prices. So there's a lot of things going against them. And I just want to piggyback one more time because this goes very granular and, and that it adds an extra layer of difficulty when you have to over collateralize plus it has to be on chain. So now that means you have to go and buy whatever the token is. Let's just use Ethereum. You know, you have to go buy 150% more Ethereum than you plan to borrow. Most people won't be able to do that from a logistics standpoint and even and, and a financial standpoint. So Goldfinch and any other private credit protocol that will be introduced that doesn't require over collateralization, they're always gonna be game changers. And of course, there are risks associated with it, but we're gonna get into all that. Yeah, and lastly, it's actually riskier for a borrower to borrow via over collateralization because you have to trust that the company or platform that you're borrowing from isn't gonna fuck off your collateral block five celsius etc etc all right so before we jump into the white paper i thought it'd be appropriate to give like uh, a slight background on the landscape of private credit so over the last couple of years pretty much you can even just go back to the pandemic when the fed slash raised to zero one thing that that does is makes private credit way more attractive because most private credit will come with floating rates and so as the fed cuts rates it makes it more attractive for an institution or a counterparty to go directly to that other counterparty uh, because it is cheaper in the long run, essentially. So you get a better bang for your buck and they started to generate double digit returns. Since then, you've seen a rapid rise in the private credit market. Last year, there was about $120 billion that were raised through private credit funds just last year. And so some people are even fearing that it's a bubble at this moment. And so one thing that adds to the bullish case on a protocol like Goldfinch is that, hey, we're getting ready to potentially go through another easing cycle now. And so look, we're at high rates at the moment. And so Goldfinch is technically being suppressed because the cost of capital is way higher. And with floating rates, super dangerous, obviously. So if we're expecting the Fed to cut rates in June, July, you can expect on the latter half of the year, that protocols like Goldfinch, other RWAs, or other private credit protocols, they'll start to do really, really well. 
as we go into that easing cycle. I think that was a pretty solid intro. So now we're going to hop into the white paper. We're going to read through it, not word for word, but we're going to read the important points and we're going to elaborate on the things that aren't self-explanatory. All right, let's start here with the introduction. So it says, Goldfinch is a decentralized protocol that allows for crypto borrowing without crypto collateral. This is kind of what we talked about here. It says a core limitation of current crypto lending protocols is that they require over collateralization. It's kind of like the pawn shop model. You go pawn your phone, you give them the phone, they tell you how much it's worth, minus some. If you don't pay back the loan, they sell your collateral and make some fees. No, Lay, that's a good analogy. When I was younger, I pawned an Xbox. It was worth about 250 I was really young. I got about 90 I would end up getting the Xbox back, but yeah, that's a great example, actually. Yep. So it says, by incorporating the principle of trust through consensus, the Goldfinch protocol creates a way for borrowers to show credit worthiness based on the collective assessment of other participants rather based on their crypto assets, aka collateral. It says the protocol can then use this collective assessment as a signal for automatically allocating capital, which we'll get into later, uh, by removing the need for crypto collateral and providing a means for passive yield, the protocol dramatically expands both potential borrowers who can access crypto and the potential capital providers who can gain exposure. Yeah, so literally the trust through consensus model literally means as you progress, the system or pools become more trustworthy. All right, so here we are on the docs. I went through the whole white paper. I was looking for the docs, but I didn't find them until I did all the research. So I'm just gonna read this one point here. It says, from the beginning, Goldfinch wanted to build for the borrowers who can benefit most and where crypto can have the greatest impact. That meant starting with lending businesses in emerging markets. A lot of banks don't lend to emerging markets because they look at it as more risky. And it says demand for crypto's liquid multinational nature tie in those regions as businesses stand to gain many benefits from using crypto due to the inefficiencies and barriers from TradFi limiting the capital that can flow into these regions. Goldfinch is currently expanding financial access for thousands of individuals around the world via its borrowers spanning 28 countries. Some of their borrowers include Payjoy in Mexico, Quick Check in Nigeria, Latin America, India, Africa, Asia, and Latin America again. So yeah, they're they're kind of spreading themselves pretty wide. All right, so now let's let's kind of get into the overview. And this is like their main prongs to the business. So it says they have four core participants: borrowers, backers, liquidity providers, and auditors. So it says the borrowers are participants who seek financing and they propose borrower pools for the backers to assess. Borrower pools contain the terms a borrower seeks, like the interest rate and the repayment schedule. Backers assess the borrower's pools and decide whether to supply first loss capital. So real quick guys, first loss capital just basically means, all right, so there's an order. We're gonna get to this in this, but there are senior tranches and junior tranches. The senior tranches get paid out first, which means the junior tranches gets paid out last. First loss capital, is the money that basically is going to be lost first in the event of a decline or default. And that is usually who's taking on that higher initial risk. And that's pr most likely gonna be the junior tranches most of the time, actually all the time. And the senior tranches basically have what you have, uh, what you call second loss capital, meaning they're gonna get paid first and then whatever's left goes to the, the junior tranche. So the junior tranche could get, if things aren't great, you know, they could be getting 50 cents on the dollar back basically yes yeah, basically to sum all of that up if there's losses the losses is going to apply to the pool where they're getting paid out uh the most yeah and then i guess on the flip side there's always so many ways to explain things on the flip side an easy way to explain it seriously is <laughs> but hey seriously guys an easy way to explain it because it is look basically when there's profits if i'm a senior tranche and he's the junior tranche i get paid first he gets paid second so if there's $100, right, and I get paid, I'm entitled to 60, he's entitled to 40, but there's only 80 left total because of the de decline, I'll get my 60 still, he's only going to get 20. If there's a default, I'm going to lose out first before him because I'm being compensated for my risk more. Yep, so to bring it home, first loss, second loss. So and, it's kind of self-explanatory. And to really bring it home, no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's hop back into it. So it says backers assess the borrower pools and decide whether to supply first loss capital. After backers supply capital, borrowers can borrow and repay through the borrower pool. Liquidity providers supply capital to the senior pool in order to earn a passive yield. The senior pool uses the leverage model to automatically allocate capital to the borrower pools based on how many borrowers are participating in them. 
When the senior pool allocates capital, a portion of the interest is reallocated to the backers. This increases the backers' effective yield, which incentivizes them to both provide the higher risk first loss capital and to do the work of assessing borrower pools. And they have this diagram here. The last tranche is the auditors who vote to approve borrowers. And this is required before they can borrow. They're randomly selected by the protocol and they provide a human level check to guard against fraud. Um, when it comes to the auditors, they're not doing like a, a traditional audit. They're effectively just making sure you do what you say you're gonna do as a pool, basically. It's like, you know, Goldfinch does a good job at having a credibly neutral consensus as Vitalik Buterin would call it. Yeah. All right, so now let's, let's kind of dive deep into each of those tranches. Let's talk about the borrower. So obviously these are people who are looking to borrow and normally you have the lenders who set the term, but Goldfinch allows the borrowers to set the terms and then they allow people who want to lend, if they like the terms, they can agree to them. So let's go over some of those terms. So it says the borrower pool is a smart contract where the borrowers borrow and repay capital. Any borrower can create a borrower pool and define the terms they want. They propose the interest rate, they propose the limit, uh, aka the total amount that can be borrowed, the payment period, like how frequent are they making payments, the term when the full principles due, and the late fees. So it says here, creating a, bar creating a borrower pool is like proposing a term sheet to backers. It doesn't guarantee the terms are going to be accepted since the borrowers still need to convince the backers to supply junior tranche first call, first loss capital, the amount borrowers can borrow is based on how much backers supply combined with the amount the senior pool allocates based on the leverage model, which we're gonna get into later. It also says here, in order to create a borrower pool, the borrower must also stake an amount of GFI equal, which is Goldfinch token, equal to double the cost of an auditor approval, which is a fixed rate set by the protocol. This guards against spam and it signals to backers that the borrower is serious and provide Goldfinch to pay for the first audit approval. So it's basically aligning the incentives. It's kind of like if you are a Bitcoin miner or Ethereum staker to validate the network and you have your funds staked and you try to approve an illegitimate transaction, it's going to get slashed. It's the same exact thing here. It's just aligning the incentives because if the incentives aren't aligned, people will do bad things every time literally all right now let's talk about these junior and senior tranches it says borrower pools have both a junior and senior tranche backer supply capital to the junior tranche and the senior pool supplies capital to the senior tranche when a borrower makes repayments the borrower pool applies the amount first towards any interest and principal owed to the senior tranche at that time and then towards any interest and principal owed to the junior tranche at that time and then it says to track the different amounts that different participants supply both backers and the senior pool receive an nft when they supply capital and you know this is why we always talk about like nfts aren't just for jpegs like they have real world use cases such as things like these the nft tracks the amount that was supplied and how much of it has been redeemed at any time a backer or the senior pool can use their nft to redeem their specific portion of the available per payments in the pool in this case the nft is basically used to verify your identity and I'm sure they're going to talk about the UID at some point here. Yeah. And it even talks about why, like you were saying, they use NFT. So they use NFTs rather than fungible tokens because it allows the protocol to ensure that no one redeems more than their proportional share of the total repayments as they, as they come in. And they even give an example here if you want to read into that. All right. So we spoke about incentives. Let's talk about some of the incentives that they have in place here. So it says the key question is what incentives borrowers have to pay back what they borrow. Because remember, this isn't over collateralization. When you're, when you're over collateralized, you have every incentive to pay back because the, your collateral is worth more than what you borrow. But here it's the opposite. So it says the first incentive is that borrowers likely want to continue borrowing from Goldfinch. And that makes sense because people who are borrowing here, they're coming here because they can't get credit anywhere else and it's cheaper here so of course they wouldn't want to just damage the relationship obviously you'll always have people who just won't give a fuck but you know that's just the cost of doing business it says the moment that they're late on a payment borrowers are unable to borrow further from any borrow pool also backers will likely stop supplying more capital if a borrower is continually late on repayments it's up to backers to determine that the borrowers do in fact want to continue borrowing from the protocol in the future. And so this is actually a huge problem in the TriFi market when it comes to private credit in that it's hard to tell if the borrower is going to pay or fail to pay. And sometimes there is a delay when that failure to pay happens in the TriFi market. 
And so obviously that spurs on a ton of communication after that. But by putting th by bringing things on chain, that stuff is kind of instantaneous. Even though it's uh, longer, I think it's three days in the in the real world. On, I'm talking about on Goldfinch. They give you three day grace period, three to seven day grace period in the real world. On chain, you get 45 days. But anyway, it's instantaneous. So now there's no more guesswork in terms of if this person is going to be able to make their payments, what date and time they fucking missed a payment, and what to do after, pretty much. It's all on chain. So it literally eliminates that problem when it comes to lenders basically having trouble seeing if their borrowers are failing to pay or not. Yep, and as the second incentive, and this one is really important, and I feel like this is the biggest one. Because borrowers need to publicize their address when proposing pools to backers, their on-chain history becomes public to future creditors, even those off-chain. So if they think they're going to just like, oh, let me borrow money from here, it's not going to affect me. Remember, they're proving their credit worthiness. Their identity is revealed, so that means mainstream banks are gonna know as well. So they won't be able to borrow money anywhere else, literally. And it says last, while not explicitly supported by the protocol, backers may form off-chain legal agreements with borrowers. Backers may require such an agreement to be in effect either with them directly, with another backer, in order to be willing to supply capital. Now, that's what they mean when they say all assets are collateralized off-chain. It's kind of misleading because when you hear that, it makes you think all assets are collateralized off-chain but it's optional between the lender and the borrower. Like if, the, if those two counterparties come to the conclusion that the borrower needs to post some collateral off chain, that will be taken care of between the lender and the borrower. And that is there, the perfect bridge between Goldfinch and TradFi. All right, now let's kind of dive into the backers. So the backers, it sounds like the backers are like investors, like in the protocol, but not in the way you think. So backers evaluate borrowers and supply the first loss capital on the borrower pool. So these are the people who are essentially making the loans. Backers can achieve higher returns when the senior pool leverages them with additional senior tranche capital. So backers look at borrower pools as an investment opportunity. They evaluate the information borrowers provide and decide if they want to supply capital to the junior tranche of a borrower pool. The senior pool provides additional senior tranche capital to the borrower pool according to the leverage model. To account for the lower risk of the senior tranche, 20% of the senior tranche's nominal interest is reallocated to the junior tranche. In addition, the protocol retains 10% of all interest payments as reserves, which are managed by the decentralized governance, AKA the DAO. That's basically the way they generate revenue, guys. All right, now let's talk about the auditors. We talked about the auditors performing pretty much background check to damn near. Let's talk about the approval vote. So borrowers need to get approved from an auditor in order to be able to borrow. borrow. And auditors are incentivized too. They have to stake Goldfinch tokens in order to be selected to even vote. And it's 10,000, I believe. $10,000 worth of Goldfinch tokens minimum. Yeah, and they earn Goldfinch rewards when they vote with the majority of other auditors. So people have an incentive to, I'm not going to say vote correctly, but most of the time, most of the people are going to agree on what's correct because everyone has their stake at stake. And it says anyone can be an auditor by staking a minimum amount of Goldfinch and passing the unique entity check. When a vote is requested, the protocol selects nine auditors on a random basis weighted by the amount of Goldfinch they have staked. So it's basically like proof of stake when it comes to voting. And, you know, you got some off-chain activity happening here as well. So they get to decide how they want to vote. So in practice, it says they may review off-chain documents provided by borrowers and communicate with borrowers directly through channels such as forums, emails, and video Zoom calls. I like the fact so much how often at every step of the way they try to bridge try to DeFi because that's always been the missing component. A lot of the times people don't want to do business with somebody they never seen, they never talked to. Even though there's algorithms in place to make sure their capital isn't lost, sometimes it just feels better to talk to the person. So the fact that they're able to, and it's kind of encouraged in a way to handle some of the business off chain, that creates a better relationship. If I know Vince in real life and our shit is on chain, I mean, trust is there pretty much. Yeah, and I think, you know, you have a lot of these crypto companies, they're trying to use like blockchain technology as the end all be all, but it's some things that's better done off chain, it's some things better done on chain. So if you combine them and do what's optimal for whatever you're doing, you get the best of both worlds. Give it up for Hannah Montana. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was gonna say, um, I was gonna add, so blockchain, is only incrementally better than most technology we have. Let's be real. 
the capabilities are far reaching, but it's slightly better than what we have in terms of information systems, right? And so that's why you don't see everything on the blockchain yet. Because if it was significantly better, everyone would be doing that already. Or we would have way more adoption than we do now. So most companies that decide to use blockchain technology as a part of their system, it will be that. It will be a part of their system. It won't be, I mean, yeah, you got some blockchain companies who are going to do 100% blockchain, but anyone who's an established TradFi player, they're never going to be 100% blockchain. It's always going to be some combination of both. Always. I think we might have to do a video on you thinking blockchain technology is incrementally better. I think it's... The capabilities far outreach anything we have now. But right now, only incrementally better in the way we use it and the way that we... Okay. So, okay. Well, okay, that part I agree with. I thought you were just talking about, like, in general. You basically think I'm saying blockchain better. sucks. No, I'm not saying that, guys. No, I thought you just said it's only a little bit better than traditional databases. Incrementally better is a little more than a little better. And incrementally it's, meaning it's increments. So you can continue to move up that chain. I think it's exponentially better. but we aren't It using could it. be exponentially better. It is, but we're not using it to its... Exactly. Okay, so exactly. we're saying the same thing. This fucking guy. He backed out because I was about to get him. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no pussy. <laughs> <laughs> all right so now let's talk about the vote outcome so a borrower submits their terms an auditor has 48 hours to provide a yes or a no or unsure and this is cool because banks they don't get no fucking time they can take fucking months and then they'll say oh you have to do redo this on your app and then you gotta wait months again and they also give you an unsure which is way more clear than like hey we need this from you we need that from you at least i know it's an unsure so i know i have to fulfill some requirements at this point yeah, because, man, when you need to borrow money, you probably need that shit pretty fast. And it's hard to borrow money. All right, so you got the full approval, and this occurs when there is at least six yes votes and no more than one no vote, right? So the borrower has approved access to the capital. The senior pool allocates the capital to the borrower pools. Then you have backer-only approval, and this is the unsure. This occurs when there is at least six yeses or unsure votes and no more than one no vote. And then you have the no approval, which is pretty self-explanatory. Then they're just not approved, and then they can just reapply and, you know, have their stuff more in order. All right, now let's talk about the liquidity providers. And these are kind of like the yield farmers, such as ourselves. If you want to learn more about yield farming, click the link in the description, book a free strategy call. But anyway, liquidity providers, they are able to provide liquidity uh, in the senior pool in order to earn a passive yield, right? And then the senior pool takes their money. So it says here, it's possible that when a liquidity provider wants to withdraw, and this is important, the same the same risk is on over collateralized protocols such as Compound. There was a fork of Compound called Tender Finance, and they were playing some pretty good yields on there, but I couldn't withdraw because all the money had been borrowed and not repaid yet. So there's always a risk. So it says here when they want to withdraw, the senior pool may not have sufficient USDC because it has been borrowed by borrowers. In this event, the liquidity provider may return when a new capital enters the senior pool through borrower repayments or new liquidity providers. So guys, there's always a risk here. They make it seem like it's super, super liquid, but that's only the case if people are repaying or new liquidity providers are coming on. And that's also why they have callable loans as part of the system as well. So that in the event that this does happen, literally one of the lenders can just call the loan due and they they have to repay the loan in full. So that mitigates the fact that there will be no liquidity sufficient enough to allow someone to withdraw. Yep. All right, now we're getting towards the end of the white paper here. Let's go through this leverage model here. So this determines how much capital the senior pool allocates towards each borrower pool based on how much it trusts each pool. So it says here, in order to determine how to allocate capital from the senior pool, the protocol uses a principle of trust through consensus. This means that while the protocol doesn't trust any individual backer or auditor, it does trust the collective actions of many of them. At a high level, when more backers supply to a given borrower pool, the senior pool increases the ratio with which it adds leverage. Which in turn increases the trust. Exactly. Know it's more. And the only reason it's adding more is because it's just like, well, all these other motherfuckers say it's good, so it must be good. So it says here, because this approach relies on counting individual backers, the protocol must ensure that they are in fact represented by different people. Therefore, all backers, borrowers, and auditors require a unique entity check to participate. And it gives you the formula here that I'm not going to go into, obviously, because what the fuck is this? But if you're a pie guy and you feel so inclined, 
go ahead and have a whirl at it. And then they also give you all of their parameters as to how they try to mitigate fraud and resistance through all the different ways. Not going to go through all this because it's boring, but yeah, the white paper is only 13 pages, so you guys can easily read through that if you want to as well. All right, so now that we went through the white paper and we believe in the fundamentals, let's see if this is a good investment. And a lot of times there are projects that are fundamentally sound, but the tokenomics are shit. So let's check out the Goldfinch tokenomics and see if this is a good investment. All right, guys, so here we are on CoinGecko. Let's look at the tokenomics here. You can see that the market cap is 94.7 million and the fully diluted valuation is 156 million. So there's a brown, uh, probably like 60 to 75% of the tokens that still has to come onto the supply. So we need to find out when they're coming on because if you're buying something, you don't wanna get dumped on. Even though we are going into a bull market and it probably won't matter, it's still good to know when a lot of tokens are gonna to come onto the market. A lot of times you'll be able to just scroll down and click tokenomics, but for some projects, they don't have them. So we're gonna have to go elsewhere. All right, so here we are back on the docs and they show the initial uh, allocation. It says, there is currently no inflation, but is expected that it will be beneficial for the protocol to incorporate a modest inflation after three years in order to reward future active participants. That makes sense. And you can see the allocations a lot of it went to the uh, early and future team. That's actually a lot. I like to see around 15 to maybe 20%, not over a quarter, 30. But, you know, I've seen worse. I've seen better. So just want to add that essentially there, the inflationary mechanism within Goldfinch, not complex at all, it is the reward system. So as they release more rewards or supply into the market in the form of distribution to these the rewards to the active participants so basically there the the inflationary mechanism within goldfinch is the rewards themselves so as they release more rewards or distribute more rewards to the participants of the network obviously that provides some inflationary effect meaning the purchasing power of each unit goes down and so yeah just wanted to explain that because it's always important and so they have by far one of the more simpler uh, mechanisms for inflationary or deflationary movements that I've seen, period, because it's simply just rewards. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and it tells you about like the percentage and what they plan on doing with it and you know why and all that stuff that you can get into. But they don't give the exact supply issuance, which I'm not going to say it's a red flag, but it would have been nice if they could have went been more transparent on that because it can make one think that it's unfavorable to investors. So let's go to another website Do you and think see. That so if we go to cryptorank.io, you can see the unlocks for each of those categories that we were looking at. So linear just means like, if it's 100 tokens releasing in 100 days, is one token releasing per day. So you can see that 27% is unlocking over 72 months. 54% is unlocking over 36 months. This one was unlocked. You got 54%. And this is the percentage of this category. Obviously, it wouldn't make sense if it wasn't. These are unlocked already. This one just finished unlocking. So you have the remaining linearly unlocking as time goes along all the way until 2025 and then 2028 of July. So it's not too bad. Most of it's already unlocked like we saw um, on the fully diluted valuation to market cap ratio. So tokenomics not too bad. And the next unlock is gonna be March 10th, which is six days from today. And it's gonna be 1.6 million at current prices and 1.09% of the supply. All right, now that we went through the tokenomics, you know, they're not my favorite, but they're not the worst. We do hold Goldfinch as a part of our institutional portfolio. So now, that we've justified that it's a good investment, albeit it is a small portion of our portfolio, let's see how they rank against their competitors and their peers. So if we go to rwa.xyz, they give you some good data on uh, private credit protocols. And another reason why we're bullish on private credit protocols in general before we get into that, you can see that in the peak of the bull market, there was $1.5 billion in loans from private credit protocols. And you can see Maple did a did the bulk of it as well as TrueFi. And that's why Maple is our largest allocation amongst these protocols. But right now we're only at 492 million. Guys, the question is, do you think that that's going to 
exceed all time highs? I think yes, interest rates are higher, so cost of capital is more expensive, and no one talks about this. These crypto companies that are coming to borrow from them, they have crypto on their balance sheets. As the bull market ensues and their balance sheet starts to balloon, it's gonna make them more credit worthy, and they're gonna come to protocols such as Goldfinch, such as Maple, such as Centrifuge, such as Clearpool, all of which we've done videos on, and they're gonna borrow. Not only that, these companies have crypto on their balance sheets as well, so it's gonna increase their risk appetite and it's gonna make them more likely to lend. So it's a positive self-reinforcing cycle. Yeah, so no, I fully agree. You know, I'm super bullish, obviously, uh, on the RWA protocols, you especially, are? just you know. a little bit, especially in the private credit space, because, so there was a survey done by Bloomberg, and this was just like a week ago they did this survey actually, and it was only 387 respondents, but these are institutions, these are large investors that they uh, surveyed. They basically, they asked them which sector in credit will perform best over the, over the next 12 months. Uh, as you can see, there are leverage loans, other high yield bonds, and private credit. By far, the expectation for private credit over the next 12 months, I would say 24 months, is extremely high. And I think part of that is already what you said. We kind of said this like three times already. Private credit in general performs well in easing environments, which means because we're higher at this moment on the Fed funds rate, you're not going to see great performance in these. You're, you're going to see a decline uh, in loan amounts pretty much. And we've seen that. The, the beginning of this year versus the beginning of last year look totally different in terms of inflows to private credit funds. And so as we move forward in the Federal Reserve, if the data keeps coming in in a way that would allow the Federal Reserve to cut, then you should see on the heels of that, you'll start to see some ramping up in private credit in TradFi and in DeFi. And once we finally get to whatever the bottom is of the next interest rate cycle in terms of the Fed funds rate, that's when you're going to see the boom in terms of private credit. Because now, basically, you can look at it like this. If interest rates are high, I like to invest in private credit. Most of them come with floating rates. It doesn't make sense for me to go heavy into private credit right now. So once we are confident we've hit that bottom, then you'll start to really see the booms. But you'll see some as we start easing because once again, they're floating, so their rates will change. Yeah, so if we scroll down here, guys, you can see the leaders in the RWA private credit space. Centrifuge is number one in terms of active loans, but you can see Goldfinch is actually number three. And in total loans, they're behind Clearpool, TruFi, Centrifuge, and Maple. So that's not bad. They have an average APY of 11%. That's the second highest. Yes, yeah, so they have an average APY of 11.05% just behind uh, Credits. And then they have, yeah, they have a cash drag of 0%. So they have 0% idle capital in all their pools, which means that once liquidity providers or backers are supplying liquidity to these pools, they're using them so sufficiently that all of it's being used. If you look at protocols like Clearpool that we covered, 15% of the capital isn't being used, and this is why it represents a smaller investment in the portfolio. This would be like if you deposited $100 in a bank and you're getting 1% APY, that 1% APY only applies to $85 instead of the whole $100. When you factor in compound interest, it really fucks you. It really does. And guys, also, their market cap is $90 million, but their active loans is $107. So they have, they're fundamentally undervalued because they have a good market cap to active loans ratio. I just want to put this in perspective of how good this actually is when it comes to liquidity. So liquidity is always uh, a key part of any asset investment, whatever. And so in this case, you can look at it like this. Imagine trying to walk through a waterfall, right? It's a very light waterfall. It's going to be easy to walk through. If, it, you're, if it's fucking Niagara Falls, you're probably not going to be able to walk through. I mean, you might, but that's just going to hurt, right? So it's kind of the same concept. That's what liquidity is. Liquidity is moving. It's different from the supply of tokens or money. It's liquidity. So it's literally liquid, right? So that's how you can look at it. The fact that uh, most of the capital, pretty much all of the capital in Goldfinch is being actively used or moved or being liquid, that increases the security of the system. Uh, increases the value of the system because you got the velocity of money working on your side. And also, it just makes it an overall safer bet because the more liquidity you have, 
the less risk that comes with that investment. We can also go over here to Dune Analytics. So you can see that since they started, the active loans went up exponentially. And then ever since the, you know, pretty much we've been in a bear market, or this was actually last December, things started to drop off. So it looks like we're consolidating around this level. That's not bad. Protocol fees kind of been consolidating, but I expect this to rise in the bull market. You got the TVL. Things are consolidating pretty high. That's good. They have a pretty high uh, repayment term. The fact that people are still using the platform with a high Fed funds rate and floating shows you the potential in the near future. Yep. And then if you look, just look at all the growth metrics, this is the total protocol of fees. This is one of the best charts on here because it shows that they're actually making money. Mm -hmm. They generated over $2.8 million. And you can see this is just going up and the repayments are going up. So that means that the auditors and the are backers, and everyone's doing a good job, right? You got the net gains going up, total loans made going up, even though it's consolidating. But like, like we said, we expect that to rise. It's funny that that chart showing the consolidation there, it makes the most sense to me because of the interest rate environment that we're in. And that's going to heavily affect private credit. I don't care what, where you at. So that's super bullish is what I'm saying. <laughs> yep. So now, you know, we're almost to the end of the video here. Let's look at their online presence. Cause a lot of times a product with a worse off product with better marketing will beat another project with a better product and not as good marketing. So if we look on their Twitter, they have about, they have 58,000 followers, a little bit over. They were mentioned in Bloomberg, you know, they pretty, they get, uh, Lots of retweets, tweets, lots of likes. They get some comments. Uh, it's not a ghost town. It's not super popping off, but we're also not in a full swing of a bull market either. They also have a YouTube channel, albeit they haven't posted a video in a year, but a lot of projects don't have YouTube channels and a lot of these are timeless and you can go and look at a lot of the inner workings of the protocol. Their Discord has 37,000 members, even though 1,500 or so are online. That just means that this many people join their server, which is good. 37K is a lot of people, guys. All right, guys, now let's kind of go through their website and you know just see what the experience is like. So we're at goldfinch.finance. You just scroll down, they talk about the senior pools, that some of the metrics we talked about, some of the active pools they have right now. This is a, a big one. Just look at their backers, guys. Andreessen Horowitz, aka A16Z, they're like the biggest crypto venture capital firm. So if they invest into you, that says a lot. Coinbase Ventures as well. Collab is a huge one as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the website looks pretty cool. It's, it's really like vintage. It's clean. It makes me feel like I'm actually like on a gold website. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, it does. And they're also hiring, which is pretty cool. So let's let's uh let's keep going here. Click for investors. We hit get started. Uh, get report. Looks like that's not working right now, but all good. Got a video on how it works. The only stable coin they work with, I don't think we mentioned this, is USDC, by the way. Which I'm not complaining about at all. Yeah, no, not at all. You guys have probably seen the stablecoin video. We kind of love government coin over here. Yeah. So governance, if you hold gold finish token and you stake it and you want to be part of, you know, being with the shits in terms of how the protocol is working, this is where you go. I've never participated in governance. Me either. And I probably never will. Yeah, same. Oh, I can't say that. Who knows? Maybe. We'll... I know I won't, honestly. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's not to say you guys shouldn't, but. Yeah. And if you click open app, <laughs> it looks like they only have one pool right now. So in order to be a liquidity provider, that's the only permissionless aspect that they have on the protocol. So if you just want to get access to a yield 8.5% on USDC, that's not too bad. It's not as liquid. So you're paying the price in two week withdrawal requests. This is going to outperform any savings account, even with current. Bro, I was about rates. to say, you said not too bad. That's BlockFi days. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Even with you, you're not going to get that at any bank right now, even though we have higher interest rates. So you click it, it gives you access to all the data. Like we said, they have the low cash drag. So they're utilizing hundred percent of the capital. They give you the loss rate, the next repayment. Wait, they need to update that. What? The next repayment. Yeah. They super need to update that. <laughs> uh, that makes me think, is this shit live right now? Yep. Gives you the source pretty, these private credit protocols give you more data than any protocols that I see in DeFi, to be honest. Yeah, they give you a lot here. 
to give you the risk mitigation. You can click read more if you want. The deal structure, the collateralization, legal recourse. See, it says this loan is secured with real-world off-chain assets as, as collateral. Yeah, you were kind of talking about that and how it's misleading. Goldfinch team, provide more clarity on that, guys. And then if you want to manage it, if you want to claim, stake, borrow, this is where you go. Obviously, I'm not doing anything on the platform, so I won't be able to see anything. But... Yeah, I think that's a pretty good walkthrough. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off that. To the founders, uh, Matt. His name Matt, right? To the founders, feel free. If, if you're watching this, come on the podcast. Let's, let's actually have a discussion. I feel like most videos are kind of doing what we did. Of course, I think we do it in a better way. But they kind of do what we do in, in terms of just breaking down the project. And of course, it's objective. So there's only so many things we can say. Objective is what I just said. So please, come on the podcast. Let's have a discussion. Let's clear up uh, some things as well. And plus, I would just love to talk to you guys. So, yeah. So, guys, I think that was a pretty deep, deep dive. We went through everything just to give you guys a little, uh, little something extra. If you subscribe to my personal channel, Crypto Noah, I'm going to make a take profit strategy and yield farming video and show how you can turn a small amount of money to a large amount with my exact take profit strategy, as well as if this is a good token to yield farm. So, be on the lookout for that. But other than that, we thank you guys for watching. If you got value, drop a like, drop a comment. Let us know what you think of Goldfinch, what you think of our research. Subscribe. And with that, we'll see y'all in the next video.